Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services at the Center for Jewish History. And we are very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event with the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, which happens to be the hometown of our author today. So she was particularly pleased about that as well. Before I introduce Sue Eisenfeld, uh, just one quick announcement that I do at all of these author events. We are still running our Summer Reading Schmooze, which is our project where all of you send us your Jewish-themed uh, summer reading recommendations, and we share lots of them on our social media and on our e-newsletters, and once a month, somebody wins a tote bag. So uh, happy to announce this month's winner is Anaya from Puerto Rico, and she is recommending a book called Shadow of His Hand by Wendy Lawton, and she says, this is a historical fiction based on the life of Anita Dittman, a Holocaust survivor. It is a great book for young readers like me, 12 years old. So thank you, Anaya. And as you can see, the contest is open to all ages. So please keep reading and uh, keep those recommendations coming. Just a couple of other housekeeping. You can put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I will chat with Sue for a while. Then she will show us some images, and then we'll get to as many questions as we have time for. Ty Marks, who's one of our reading room librarians, is helping out today with logistics and the slideshow. She is behind the CJH logo. If it's not already set that way, you can choose to set your Zoom window to speaker mode so that you only see the person who's actually speaking. All right, let me introduce Sue. Sue Eisenfeld is the author of Wandering Dixie, Dispatches from the Lost Jewish South, uh, which just came out a few months ago. Uh, there's a link to purchase in the comments, as well as in the reminder email you should have received this morning. Uh, I would hold up the book, but I read it on Kindle, so it's not much to look at. She is also the author of uh, Shenandoah, A Story of Conservation and Betrayal, 2015 and a contributing author to the New York Times Disunion, A History of the Civil War from 2016. Uh, she writes about her passions, history, travel, culture, hiking, nature, relationships, and life. Her work has been listed five times among the notable essays of the year in the Best American Essays, and has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Forward, Civil War Times, Washingtonian, Gettysburg Review, Potomac Review, Virginia Living, and many other publications. She teaches nonfiction writing for the MA in Science Writing program at Johns Hopkins University and works as a freelance writer and communications consultant. She holds an MA in writing from Johns Hopkins and a BS in natural resources from Cornell University. Born in Philadelphia, she is a longtime resident of Arlington, Virginia. So welcome, Sue. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. I'm very glad you could join us. Um, I know you're going to show a slideshow later, but I have to ask, what is that image behind you? Thanks for asking. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually located in Arlington, Virginia, but what is behind me, my virtual background, is the synagogue in Sumter, South Carolina. And um, this is one of what I call the lost Jewish places. It, it's a place that once had quite a, a pretty large uh, Jewish, Jewish congregation. It had um, 390 members at its peak. And um, unfortunately now, I think there are about seven congregants left. And um, this is one of the buildings where, uh, because it's a lost Jewish community, had to be taken over by another entity. But it's been a great thing because it's preserved the building. It's been taken over by the Sumter County Museum and it's now the Jewish History Center in that town. Great, and I know you're gonna show us some more images of other synagogues uh, in a little while. Um, but let's start by talking about the title of your book. Uh, Dixie has become kind of a hot button term recently, though it's of course a historical name for the region for better or worse. So what went into choosing the title and did you have any conversations about that? That's a great question. Um, the title of this book was chosen last year. And I have to say at the time, there was really no discussion about the term Dixie per se, 
other than it being an identifier for the South. You know, as you mentioned, like recently, uh, people have been changing names of things like the Dixie Chicks and um, Lady Antebellum are two musicians who have recently changed their names because I think their names really glorified the South. And I think they realized that that glorification wasn't what they wanted to be about. And in my case, I think that the book, well, the book definitely isn't about glorifying the South and um, the title was really meant to be an identifier. But one interesting thing um, I might mention about the title is, you know, it, it is a Jewish book. It's about Southern Jewish history, but it is also a lot about um, African-American history. And, you know, the title doesn't really reflect that. So one of our conversations about the title is how do we get in the idea of race or racial relations? And we kind of decided that, you know, the term race is really problematic. There really is no such thing as race. And uh, it was difficult to find sort of a one word um, indicator of that theme of the book. So we stuck with um, indicating that it was a travel book through the wandering, indicating that it was a Jewish book and indicating that it was a Southern, Southern travel book. Oh, great. So let's talk a little bit more about the genre of the book. You've called it a historical travel memoir. So for the people who haven't read the book, can you explain what that means? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So it's not a scholarly book. It's in the genre of what, what we writers would call creative nonfiction or narrative nonfiction or literary nonfiction, where I'm the storyteller, um, I'm doing the traveling. And what I show you about uh, the Jewish South is, is through my eyes and it's through my um, perceptions and, and my influences. It's, it's my journey of understanding and discovery, but it's framed by factual information that I draw from, you know, scholarly sources. So in a way, I'm trying to amplify the work of scholars by bringing in their work uh, to provide context to what I'm seeing and learning about. But it is not necessarily meant to be... Um, new scholarly work. I mean, I think I, I think I do present things possibly in, in ways that haven't been presented before. And, and certainly when I set out to do the book, I, I wanted to do a general interest book that hadn't been written. And as far as I could tell, there hadn't been written a historical travel memoir from the point of view of a northerner going south to discover the lost Jewish South, which, which is what I'm doing. So I, I kind of approached it like it's going to be my, my point of view, but I'm going to interview people, uh, just observe and, and be immersed in, in where I'm going, and then frame it all in research. Well, that leads well into my next question, which is how did you come to write this book, which, as you say, was not in your original field of expertise. You clearly did a lot of research. The bibliography is extensive. So how did this start and what was the journey like for you? So the book really has its origins when I first found myself in a Richmond cemetery, the Hebrew cemetery of Richmond, and discovered that there were Jewish Confederates buried there. As a northerner, this was just completely outside of my worldview. You know, I, I came from ancestors who are from Eastern Europe who came around 1900 to New York. And as far as I knew that that was the Jewish experience in America. And of course, I mean, now, now that I know more, that sounds really uh, limited and really sheltered. But at the time, the idea of Jewish Confederates was really new. Nobody I knew from the North knew anything about Jewish Confederates. And I really just followed the trail of my interests to find out, well, if they were fighting in the, in, in the Civil War, they must have been here earlier than the Civil War. And, and, and indeed, they, they had uh, come here as early as the late 1600s. So I kind of went down you know, a rabbit hole of, of different interests. I was already interested in the Civil War. I'd been living in the South for quite some time by this point, but there was a lot that I didn't know. So um, this is what a travel writer does. I went to the places I wanted to know more about and met with people. You know, it was, it was partly spontaneous. I went on road trips. I contacted people 
and met with them, you know, sort of on the fly. Some things were more planned than other things. And I, I guess overall, you know, I wanted to unveil the complexity of the Southern Jewish history and in particular its intersection with African American history and, and do it in a way that I hadn't seen other writers do it before. I, you had a big question, I think. Did I answer some I, I of it? You, <laughs> um, you just mentioned a little bit about some of the earliest Southern Jews in the 17th century who tended to be Sephardim. So can you tell us about them and how that balance shifted over the centuries? Yeah, so the, the Sephardic Jews, and th this is the, the area I didn't know much about before this, you know, came, came very early to a variety of, of ports, north and south. I mean, the earliest Jews in New York and Rhode Island were Sephardic Jews and, and came before those that came to Charleston and Savannah. But people sometimes talk about three waves of Jewish immigration, and the, the first being the Sephardic, who have roots in Spain, Portugal, of course, Amsterdam, and the islands. A lot of the southern Jews came through the islands. People talk sometimes about the second wave being around mid 1800s, um, the German Jews. That's not to say there weren't some German Jews before that and after that. And then, of course, the third wave of Jewish immigration being the Eastern European Jews, late 1800s, early 1900s. And, you know, this is what I, that was what I was familiar with. And as some people described it to me, it, it's kind of like the, the last wave or, or the, that third wave. Their culture has kind of taken over, if you will. Which, which might explain why it seemed to me that, that that was the culture of Jews in America, period. But I, I found it very interesting to look into the earliest Jews because of course these, these were the Jews who fought in the revolution, fought in the War of 1812, the Civil War, and learning about this period of time, I, I found ex extremely interesting and something that isn't talked about that, as much, I think. Great. Um, so you talk a lot about how the Southern Jews were extremely assimilated on the whole. So can you tell us a little bit about, in, you know, in what ways the South was kind of, you know, good for the Jews and, you know, how they are visible, so-called whiteness helped them? And, and what about the anti-Semitism that you hear about? Yeah, so, I mean, there's always, there's always anti-Semitism, I think, wherever Jews have gone. That, that's a given. But from the people I've talked to and the, the research that I've seen, the, the South was good for the Jews. They could get ahead because of their whiteness. And I, I know that there's, there's some debate among Jewish people now as to whether or not they consider themselves white or passing for white. But the way I look at it, Jews were able to get ahead. Jews were able to be leaders in their communities. Jews owned slaves. They, they could move up in society. I, I look at it like they could benefit from their whiteness. And, you know, in the South, I think there was a, a great emphasis on going to church. And uh, I've read so many places that, you know, going to the quote unquote Jewish church was just as good as going to any other church. And from stories I've heard, the Christian community really uh, welcomed the Jews. They were part of Jews building their temples in a lot of places. They helped Jews rebuild their temples if they burned down due to fire, uh, donating money, donating services, allowing Jews to use their churches if the temple was uh, not, not occupiable. You know, there are even people, uh, non-Jews, who attend temple just because they find it interesting. And th that's not to say that that never happened in the North, but I, I was really struck by how prevalent that seemed throughout the history of the Jewish South. And, you know, Jews were also merchants in, in the South. They often ran stores that were unlike other stores that were already being run. So they really filled a niche in communities and I think were valued for that. So although, yes, there's always anti-Semitism, I really just found so many stories of um, Jews being valued in the South which really struck me because one of my biases coming into this project was that I thought that the South was, of course, very anti-Semitic and, and, and why would Jews live there? But what, what people revealed to me was that it, it, it's not so black and white in that, in that sense. Um, can you talk also about how um, 
sometimes the Jews were reluctant to call out the racism in their midst because they were in somewhat of a precarious position? Yeah, that's one of the things I found most interesting. And it, it was sort of revealed to me when I was in Selma. And so, so Jews were the, the store owners and they wanted to keep their white neighbors happy, uh, not just for business, but because they had to live there. So their white neighbors might be members of the White Citizen Council, which was kind of a glorified KKK in a way, but they, they had to live there in their midst. At the same time, they, Jews were some of the only people sometimes selling to uh, black customers. And they, they did believe, I think, in, in the rights, civil rights of black people and wanted to keep their black customers happy. But it was really a fine line uh, as to like how activists they could be in order to keep the tenuous trust of their white neighbors and and keep the, the business of their black neighbors. So uh, that was one one area of particular interest and sort of difficulties that the Southern Jews faced. Like how much how much could they really be activists, for example, during the civil rights movement? Um, and when you began your travels, as you said, you were much more familiar with the Northern Jewish freedom fighters of the 1960s uh, than, say, the Southern Jewish slave owners or Judah Benjamin and others profiting from the system. So with all that you know now, how do you reconcile those countries? Well, I mean, there are good people, quote unquote, good people and quote unquote, bad people among any any type of people and, and I think that the Jews are no exception um, but I think if you really parse out you know individuals so so you had the you had the Jewish slave owners and which was a surprise to me but there there were Jewish slave owners and but then you also had Jews who didn't didn't believe in slavery there were Jews who wouldn't fight on the side of the Confederacy there were Jews who freed their slaves. There were Jews who wrote in their wills to free their slaves. I even came across some letters between people of a Jewish family after the Nat Turner insurrection, where they basically said, you know, we're, we need to really examine ourselves and how we're responsible for slavery. Uh, so I think there were always people who were questioning it. So there's just, there's just people on both sides of issues. You know, you, you had Andrew Goodman coming down from the North and trying to do good things. You had um, Julius Rosenwald, who was another Northern Jew coming down South, who worked with Booker T. Washington to open 5,000 schoolhouses for underfunded black communities. And so I, I think it's, I think it's easy to say, well, well, look at the Northern Jews and all the good things that they did, which, which is true. And, but I think there was, there was some, some protest in the midst and, and, some, and definitely interest in, in doing good in the South too. I think it, it is, again, not so black and white. This is one of the many issues that I sort of cover that it doesn't have a real easy answer. It, does that answer your question? Sure, I mean, it's not really an answerable question. <laughs> But yeah. it's an interesting thing to talk about. And I just briefly mentioned uh, Judah Benjamin. Do you want to talk about him at all? Yeah, he's an interesting figure, as, as some of you might already know. He was a, a Jewish senator from Louisiana who went on to become attorney general for the Confederacy, secretary of war, and secretary of state for the Confederacy. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot written about Judah Benjamin. Um, I think Jews feel conflicting things about him. But one thing I find interesting is that we have Jefferson Davis, who was president of the Confederacy, appointing a Jew to some of the highest positions of government anywhere in the world, which is kind of crazy and sort of really notable, I think, uh, given that this was, you know, mid 1800s. And we're talking about the Confederacy and Southerners, who I think many of us tend to think were we're anti-Semitic, we're racist, you know, we have, there's a lot of negative ideas about the Confederacy, and yet Jefferson Davis appointed this guy who's, who is openly Jewish, although maybe not practicing, but 
So, so he's one of the figures I do find interesting. And there's, there's a great biography of him written by Eli Evans, if anybody wants to learn more about him. Uh, so can you talk about how some of the contemporary Southern Jews that you met buy into the so-called lost cause mythology and what that means for them? So the lost cause mythology, just, just to cover what that really means briefly, is, is a period of time from the late 1800s to early, to the first couple decades of the 1900s where there was a, a purposeful rewriting of Confederate history to glorify the Confederacy, to um, make it so that the men who fought and died didn't die in vain, to um, erase the ideas that they fought to preserve slavery, to, um, to say that slavery wasn't that bad or that it was, it was you know, the slaves were happy to preserve the way of life and, and states rights. And, and, and it was really, I, I think a lot of people talk about it as sort of a brainwashing, you know, just a rewriting of history. And this is the period of time where ladies memorial associations or the daughters of the Confederacy put up all the monuments. I mean, the monuments didn't go up after the Civil War. They went up like decades later. They rewrote textbooks throughout the entire nation to glorify the Confederacy. They renamed schools. You know, even here where I live in Arlington until last year, we had Washington Lee High School. They equated, in many cases, George Washington with Robert E. Lee so that kids would grow up equating them in their minds. This school was just changed. But in any case, um, some of the people I talked to, you know, grew up in, in this environment. Um, one man who I profile in the book told me he, he grew up going to a club called um, Children of the Confederacy. It's related to the Sons of the Confederacy, Daughters of the Confederacy. He grew up going to Children of the Confederacy, singing Confederate songs, learning about all the generals. Um, he had Confederate ancestors. And, and I think it's, it's no surprise that, and you really can't blame people for growing up in an environment where, where that's what they're taught. I just think that you know, there's, there's a broader perspective that, that people are aware of now. People, people know what happened in the rewriting now. But when you're brought up that way, you know, that's what you believe. So this one person that I profile is really interesting to me because he's an observant Jew. He's very devout, keeps kosher. You know, he, his Judaism is extremely important to him. And he is um, really dedicated to preserving Confederate monuments because they were his ancestors and he feels that the reason they fought was not for slavery, but because there was a Northern aggressor. And, and, that's, and that's the line that, um, that people hang on to. And, and it's hard to argue against it for people that hold it so close who it really means something to, you know, their own ancestors. Um, I think it's hard to, to divorce them. And um, it's much easier to, to glorify them in your mind. So I have a whole chapter about this one individual I found so interesting, actually a really lovely person. And, and another example of just how this is, it's more complex than meets the eye. I don't necessarily think that people who believe all this are bad people. This is what has been taught to generations of children. In fact, just the other day in the Washington Post, people were talking about how even in the 1970s, their textbooks still talked about the happy slave and um, the war was fought for, um, you know, preserving the way of life and against a Northern aggressor and that sort of thing. So uh, a lot of this research that you did in these interviews were happening before the current moment. So do you think the responses would have been different? Do you think there's been any learning or just more entrenched? You know, I think that I was doing this research in the, the lead up to the current moment. We, we were in the current moment, I think, still at that time. So I, I'm not sure that their answers would be any different. I think that there's, uh, you know, there's still the same pro and against monument building, monument taking down. I, I'm not sure that it, it would have changed. I, I, think that, I think that the people I talked to, you know, especially this one person that I profile, you know, he said, I want to be a good person. Um, he believes in, uh, 
you know, not, not doing things that are offensive to people. So there's an inherent contradiction, I think, with, with the monuments in that sense. Um, do you want to tell us about any other uh, historical figure that you found particularly interesting or complicated? Yeah, so this is an individual that I, I don't actually write that much about in the book, but I think is also an example of sort of the complicated and so interesting intersection of things. It's a man named Moses Ezekiel. He became a sculptor and actually um, his sculpture of religious liberty is outside the Jewish Museum in Philadelphia. So he was born in Richmond, but had uh, his parents were from Philadelphia. So he had sort of the North South. He was a total pro South pro Confederate Jewish guy first Jewish cadet at the Virginia Military Institute, fought in the Civil War as a cadet, became, became this artist who wound up doing lots of sculptures about religious liberty. And the thing that I think is so ironic and so interesting is that his sculpture of Jefferson at, at UVA is the sculpture that the Unite the Right rallied around in 2017, shouting, Jews will not replace us. You know, doing this around a sculpture that was created by this super Confederate Southern Jewish guy, I just thought was super ironic. So he just seems to exemplify a lot of the, the different forces, you know, that that have gone on in history. So, uh, so you do uh, end your book with a tour of places associated with Nat Turner. So can you explain, because uh, I'm not sure it's come out fully yet, how the researching of this book also became a journey into African American history and how these two went hand in hand? Yeah, so there's really like two touch points that I came across that I found compelling. Two intersections between Jewish history and African American history, and that is slavery and the civil rights movement. So, you know, Jews owned slaves, Jews were involved with the civil rights movement, how do these ideas go together? You know, traveling the landscape of the civil rights movement, it was hard to not include that in the book, but I'm also related to Andrew Goodman, who is one of the three civil rights workers who was slain in 1964. So I had a kind of personal quest to want to see the landscape that he was going into and examine the issues that he was fighting for, which had to do with voting rights for African Americans. And, and I guess I, I also just got into the issue of, you know, the way that Jews were able to do well in the South, like I mentioned before, was in large part, I think, because of their whiteness. So what this book became for me, really, overall, I think, was a journey of becoming more woke. Maybe that should have been the secondary title of my book. You know, there's a lot of people who say things like, well, my ancestors weren't slave owners. You know, well, my ancestors came over in 1900. I had nothing to do with that. But that's all well and good, but how did those ancestors benefit by being able to insert themselves into white society pretty easily? How have, how have we benefited you know, by other mechanisms that were more available to white people and not available to African-Americans? So you know, that, that is the kind of line of thinking that, that a good part of the book um, is about, is about examining just just how it is that, that we were able to benefit and, and what that really looks like today for people who are alive today. And, you know, it, it did, this, this work and this travel did come at a time where people were having increased consciousness. I mean, I started the book literally two months after the uh, Charleston shooting in 2015. And, you know, I was doing this research during the 2016 election I was doing this research during the 2017 Charlottesville incident. And, 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 now the, and now the book came out, you know, April of this year, which is like right in the middle of all of this. So it is examining the issues that are going on in society today and looking, 
looking in the past as well. And, and what do you hope that readers get out of the book? You know, I think above all, I hope that they have their own journey of discovery and understanding. One of my friends, mother told me that when she was finished my book, she went right to some of the suggested readings that I put at the end to read more about reparations for slavery. And I thought that's a perfect reaction to the book is to learn more. You know, because I do talk about some lost Jewish communities that actually became very dear to me by, by being there. I'm also hoping that readers will be moved to want to help save them and open their pocketbooks actually. So on my website, uh, sueisenfeld.com, I have a link for uh, Sadaka for giving and a list of places that you can donate to actually help save individual places. And third, you know, given the environment that we're in right now, I'm, I'm hoping that the book will inspire people of, um, you know, all, all people to vote. You know, I do, I do talk about Andrew Goodman, as I said, who was working on voting rights issues. So I hope that people will be inspired to vote, to help other people to vote, and even to donate to the Andrew Goodman Foundation, which is run by his brother, David Goodman, which is a nonpartisan organization that, that helps promote democracy and, and voting rights. So those would be wonderful outcomes from people reading the book, in my opinion. Uh, well, do you want to show us some more of those lost places? Yes. Uh, Ty, can you get this slideshow up? Tell you a little bit about some of the communities that I visited. So this is Eufaula, Alabama. It's the first place I went. It's the Jewish cemetery. There is no temple there anymore. But I'll just say, um, and you can go to the next slide. The cemetery is still there. And uh, this is just one example of the Jewish Confederate graves that I saw. But just FYI, Eufaula used to have 105 Jews in 1878, and now there's one family left. So one chapter of my book is about that family and, uh, and the community there. Uh, the next place I went um, is, oh, oh, so this is Eufaula also. This is on the banks of the Chattahoochee River. Sue, so one thing you didn't mention is about how sometimes the Jews were sort of a victim of their own success because they were extremely well assimilated and intermarried and often lost touch with their roots of the community. Yeah, that's right. That's an interesting point. I think that the Jews, you know, Jews always want to assimilate wherever they go, right? And part of that has to do with intermarriage. And I think that what many people told me was, you know, Jews wanted to be, so, Jews were Southerners before they were Jews in some ways. I mean, they did practice their religion, but they made a lot of compromises, if you will, like in small places where they didn't have kosher butchers and things like that, they, they may do in their own interesting ways. Uh, I do talk about Jewish food in the South as part of my book as well, which, which deals a little bit with that issue. But this is Selma, Alabama. And this temple, uh, well, th they were, uh, this was settled in the 1830s. There are about 140 families in the 1920s. And there are about four people now who are congregants here at Michigan Israel. They are raising money to save this temple. It is in disrepair. So it's one of the places that I list on my website that uh, I hope to, to help Ronnie Leet, who is president, uh, help him raise money, try to repair the place. The next slide is in, oh, actually, yeah, if you could just forward the slides, I don't, I can't remember what's next. Okay, so this is Selma also. This is a huge Jewish cemetery in Selma, which was actually in, in great condition. It's part of a larger cemetery. Thank you. So the next one is in Natchez, Mississippi. This is the oldest congregation in Mississippi. Uh, the first peddlers came in the 1700s. This synagogue had 450 people in 1905 as congregants. And now, uh, when I was there a few years ago, there were 12, about 12 people left. This was one of the cases, I believe, where the first temple was built in 1872. And then 
burned down and, and the Christian community helped rebuild in 1906. So this is one of the ones that has been saved, actually. It's been taken over, I believe, by the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. And, but they are still raising money for renovation to, to maintain it. It's still in use. It's an event venue now, as well as uh, used for services when needed. Thank you. So this is the inside of that temple at a, at a conference that I was at. This was the most people that had been in this building for many, many years. There was about 100 people and maybe 200 people. And they had to get prayer books from communities nearby because there weren't enough to go around otherwise. Thank you. So, yeah, this is the, this is one of the, areas of the Jewish cemetery in Natchez. Uh, this is called Jewish Hill. And there's an older one too, but it was a pretty well-maintained and very big cemetery in Natchez, Mississippi. So this is Vicksburg, Mississippi. This, the, the Jews came in the early 1800s. There were 90 families in 1865 and 200 and I'm sorry, 467 Jews in 1927. Uh, when I was there a few years ago, they were basically closing down. There were just a few people left. There hadn't been children in the religious school for 25 years. Um, since then, both the temple and the cemetery have been taken over by the National Park Service because this is adjacent to Vicksburg Military Park, which is a great ending actually, because now it will be preserved. You know, the, the worry for a long time was like, what was gonna happen to the building and to the cemetery? And now, and now it will be taken care of in perpetuity. This is Port Gibson, Mississippi. First Jews arrived in Port Gibson in 1839. In 1859, there were 22 Jews who formed a congregation. This building, which is gorgeous, was built in 1892. And records show there were 101 Jews in 1905. Now there are none, not, not a single Jewish person left in town. The building also has been preserved by a private individual. And, and there's still a Jewish cemetery as well. And so again, I think that in some ways, this is a good ending to a place that has no more Jews and that the building is being maintained. This is in Clarksdale, Mississippi. This uh, congregation began in 1896. There were still 131 children in the Sunday school in 1939 but then only 46 families by the 1920s. And now when I was in Clarksdale last, which was like 2017, there are maybe seven people left. So this temple is no longer a Jewish temple. Um, it was bought by a church, but the cemetery, uh, which I don't have pictures of here, but the cemetery is still being kept up, which is a good thing. I believe it's being kept up by a private individual. This was one of the most charming, beautiful little synagogue. This is in St. Francisville, Louisiana. First Jews came to St. Francisville in the 1850s. They built the temple in 1903, but it had it already closed by 1921 because Jews were going to bigger places, New Orleans and whatever. The there were various issues, you know, the reasons that Jews left in all of these communities was often just for better opportunities somewhere else. But this one sort of happened kind of quickly. I don't have any numbers on how many Jews there were. It's a pretty small place. There were enough for an active congregation for a short period of time, and now there are none. Again, this lost Jewish community had a sort of good outcome in that the place is, uh, be is restored and it's used as an events venue it was purchased by the Julius Freyhan Foundation, and he was, the, he was the Jewish benefactor of that town. And so it is still being kept up. It's a cute place. There's a cemetery, very small Jewish cemetery that's been kept up by one person. I'm not sure what's gonna happen to it after she's gone. This is the outside of that same place. 
I believe it's called Temple Sinai. This is the cemetery in Natchitoches, Louisiana. And this is perhaps one of the saddest stories that I came across, which is that, you know, at its height, there were maybe 25 families or, or maybe more, but 25 families in 1921, there are 10 or fewer Jewish people left now. There's no temple and the cemetery is in terrible disrepair. There's been a family that was Jewish in its past, but that hasn't been Jewish for two generations, that has been taking care of the cemetery as best as they can, but basically it, there's no funding source. And so I believe I have a few slides showing um, this lovely place, but sort of in disrepair. And I think the family that's been taking care of it is really distraught over the fact that there's no plan for this place. And I think if you look at any of these old cemeteries, you're gonna see falling down graves, you're gonna see graves that have been damaged, but you know, some of them have been able to raise money to repair them, to put up walls, to repair walls. And, and this place is just running out of the funds that they used to have, which was really sad to see. I think there might be one more photo. Okay, no, this is a different place. Okay, so now we're in Helena, Arkansas. I thought this was just a very unusual collection of headstones. They are pieces of, they look like pieces of logs. But Helena, Arkansas, the first Jews came in the 1840s. There were 400 Jews in 1927. And now I don't believe there are any Jewish people left. I went there to talk to a family, the Solomon family, where one man was 100 years old. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to meet him, but I, I, he's gone now, and I don't think there's anybody left. The temple is now an art center. I think the next slide is Temple Bethel, and it's an art center and a public venue as well. And then this final slide I put in here, even though it's not a lost Jewish community, this is Charleston. South Carolina, which has several temples, thousands of Jewish families. First Jews came here in 1695, which I thought was super notable. It had the most Jews of anywhere in the United States in 1820. The temples are kept up. But this cemetery, the Cumming Street Cemetery, which dates to 1762, is in need of repair it you know this is like revolutionary war era and the walls are crumbling and they're fundraising to try to keep it up but i wanted to include it here because i just think it's one of the most notable southern jewish historical sites i think in the south and, and it really does need an infusion of funds to help it survive there's many notable people in this cemetery so that, that's a sampling of the places I've been and, and the places that I talk about in the book. Thank you, Sue. Um, before we get to the Q&A, and there are lots of questions, do you want to just remind people where they can go to help support some of these places? Yeah, so if you go to sueisenfeld.com, there's a link for Sadaka, And on that page, you'll see various different causes, the Andrew Goodman Foundation, and then place by place, Selma, Freyhound Foundation and St. Francisville, et cetera, where if you felt compelled, so I'm realizing I don't have Charleston on that list right now, but um, if you felt compelled to donate, I certainly don't benefit at all from uh, any monetary contributions. Those are links directly to the organizations, but something to consider if you're interested. Okay, great. So let's pop into the Q&A. Um, we'll get through a bunch. The first question I see is, do you, do you know about any Jewish abolitionists from the South? That's a good question. In terms of like actively fighting against slavery in, on the order of like Harriet Tubman, um, no, I'm, I'm not aware of that. But I know that, um, like I said before, there, there were people who did things in sort of small ways but that, that's, that's not something that I came across um, 
someone working like for the Underground Railroad or something like that. That's not to say that it doesn't exist, but I, I'm personally not aware. And related question, were Southern Jews any more likely than others in the South to question slavery? From what I've been able to tell, no. I remember when I first went to Charleston, uh, one of the things that a rabbi told me was that when the Civil War broke out, every man of, you know, soldier age went off to fight. I think one of the issues that has come up during the lost cause was that people said, well, people weren't fighting to preserve slavery. That, that's one of the, sort of the ideas that's been rewritten. They weren't fighting to preserve slavery. But if you actually look at the articles of secession, especially like for the state of South Carolina, it, it's very, very clear that they were seceding so that they could maintain slavery. So in that sense, you know, I think that Jews went off to fight the Civil War, i.e. fighting for slavery, just like everybody else. Um, everything that I came across suggested that if Jews could own slaves, they did. If they could afford to own slaves, that they, they did. In fact, um, Rabbi Bertram Korn, who um, wrote some of the seminal work on Jews in the Civil War, you know, that's basically what he said. If Jews could afford it, they own slaves. And if you look at the numbers, especially in South Carolina, I do itemize that in the book, they, they definitely did own slaves in about the same percentage as other white people. Um, here's a question about the Jews coming from the islands. I assume you mean the Caribbean islands. And similar question, what was the extent of Jewish involvement in slave ownership plantations and the slave trade among those who came over from the Caribbean? I wonder because in that era, slavery was pervasive in the Caribbean. Yeah, I think that a lot of people came from an environment of slavery. And so in that sense, it was normalized for them. Um, people like Judah Benjamin, for example, I believe he came... St. Croy um, definitely had grown up in an environment of slavery, came to accept slavery as normal. Uh, I think I lost the thread of that actual, oh, how many of them were involved with slave trading and whatnot? Um, so there were, you said there's, there's a slave trade from Africa to other places. There's a slave trade from Africa to the U.S. and, and sort of in between. Um, I believe that from what I've been able to tell, you know, there, there's Jews who are involved with everything at some point. Um, but I believe that um, Jews were not as active in the actual cross-Atlantic slave trading as um, domestic slave trading. But more what I read about is the slave ownership than the slave trading. Although people, you know, Jews are always pigeonholed as being the traders and the financial brokers and whatnot. And, and that is partly true. They, they were the traders and financial brokers and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, even, even just sort of ordinary people owned slaves to work in their, even their urban houses. So, you know, I think when you think of slave trading, you think of big operations. Um, when you think of slave ownership, sometimes you think of plantations. But not all Jews owned plantations. Sometimes they may have just owned a few, like 10 or fewer slaves working in a more urban house type situation. I mean, I think that we all want to think of, all of us Jews want to think of ourselves as not being as bad. Um, but I think that when you start to read the history, it's hard to, to get out of the fact that, that Jews did own slaves and were involved with that, with that trade as well. Uh, did you encounter any African-American Jews in the South? Um, I didn't, but, you know, of course there are African-American Jews. I, I didn't actually want to pursue and write about some people who have already written, been written about a lot. I didn't want to, like, pick one person who, you know, who people have already chosen to be a representative of, of that demographic. So, no, I didn't uh, personally uh, get into that in the book. And these, these so-called lost places, why did the Jews leave most of these places in the South? So uh, one reason is that, you know, Jews were always interested in where they could have the best opportunities for business. And although, let's say, one set of Jews 
uh, settled in a place and opened their shop and perhaps their son or, or children ran the shop in the next generation, there, there came a time when, when another generation didn't want to run their father's shop and went to, got a, went, went to college, got educated and, and wanted to live in the bigger cities. So, you know, one thing my, my book doesn't talk that much about, but that I do want to acknowledge is there's still plenty of Jews in Southern places. Um, they may be more concentrated though in Atlanta and Birmingham and, you know, New Orleans and the bigger cities. So that's, that's what a lot of Jews did was go to the bigger cities when the opportunities were better. There were also issues of, you know, when the cotton trade wasn't doing so well, the Jews weren't doing so well because the Jews were involved with the cotton trade as, as brokers. And, and uh, so, you know, their businesses supported the cotton trade or they were brokers. And so if, if things were going south, so to speak, in those areas, they found other things to do. Um, there are a few comments and questions about the symbols on the tombstone. Some people are asking what they are, and then uh, someone is commenting, interesting to see the Alpha Omega on a tombstone in Vicksburg Cemetery. So I wonder if that's the one other people were asking about. Oh, I don't know if we can go back and look at that again, but um, I know one thing, you know, that, that I saw a lot were the, um, I, I don't even know what to call it, but the, the, the blessing hands, basically. Um, there's a lot of symbolism in gravestones and I don't, you know, I'll just admit, I, I don't know about much about of what, what it all means. And I'd have to look at that, that slide again to, to know exactly which one we're talking about, but there's a lot of information online <laughs> to find out about what different cemetery symbols mean. You know, that there are some standard symbols that are used to mean certain things. I'm sorry, uh, I can't answer that. How did you decide which cities to visit? That's a great question. Um, so one of the organizations that really helped me and that I also really support was the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. And I had a contact there who I talked to about where I should go. That, that organization supports Southern Jewish communities, which are often small Jewish communities. And there's a fantastic um, encyclopedia, if you will, on their website that goes through all of the small places where Jews once lived. And so I was talking to people there, excuse me, about where should I go? You know, where are there people left? I had decided when I wrote this book that I wanted to go to rural places and I wanted to go to small places. I, I didn't want to have a metropolitan experience in the South. That wasn't what I was looking for. So even before I knew that I was writing about the Jews of the South, I knew that I wanted to write about the rural South. South. So, you know, I talked to, I talked to people about where, where are there people with active congregations or with congregations um, where there used to be a lot of people. And so I, I got all kinds of names. And the reason I ended up in certain places and not others is sometimes because I called someone up at the last minute and they happened to be there. And that turned into a fabulous experience. Um, you know, I also, uh, this, this trip, I, I was kind of winging some things and trying to plan other things, sometimes planning on the fly. I was also self-funding my trip and my, my book, my whole experience, so I couldn't get everywhere. There were definitely places that were recommended to me that I just couldn't get to because, you know, I had to work. <laughs> so it was a little bit by happenstance and a little bit just uh, based on some roots that I began carving out for myself. You know, I knew I wanted to go to Andersonville prison and I knew I wanted to end up in Vicksburg, for example, on one of my trips. And so planning like what route I was going to take and what I would pass along the way and what I considered too big to stop at or small enough to stop at uh, were some of the the things that went into why I wrote about the places I wrote about. I mean, I would have loved to continue to travel and write about more places, but I did have to stop eventually. And someone else is asking, have you contacted Chabad to help preserve the cemeteries? I have not. I have personally not. Um, I know that a lot of these places are looking into grants and that sort of thing, and I don't know where they have been reaching out to, but um, I, I have not followed that, that line myself. You know when the earliest Ashkenazi Jews arrived in the South? Hmm. 
That's a good question. I mean, you know, it's fair to say that generally speaking, if we are talking about waves of Jewish immigration, that the wave of Eastern European Jews came starting in the late 1800s. But, and that, and that would be for North and South, as far as I know. So I guess I don't have an exact answer, no. But I do know that, you know, lots of people I talked to mentioned that the sort of culture and flavor of the Jewish communities did change when the Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews came to the South, just the nature of the, um, the stores and the nature of the Jewish culture in general. So it was a big influence. I can't say exactly when it began, unfortunately. Um, one of the, I'll just say one of the things I do in the book um, is provide a, a list of resources for people who do want to know more. Um, I refer you to scholars who have done great work in the area of Southern Jewish history. And as Lauren mentioned before, I, I do have a long source list, um, you know, for individual facts that I talk about in the book. So if there's an area of interest that someone has, um, I think you'll be able to trace some, some good places to read more. Someone wants to know if the photos that you showed are in the book. No, there are no photos in the book, but there are photos on my website, not necessarily all of the ones I just showed today. I, I curated those photos uh, for today in particular. And there are others on my website and I, and I will add more. Um, I know people wanna know what these places look like, but unfortunately the book doesn't have any maps or photos. Uh, there are a few questions about the Lehman Brothers, whether you got into their story at all, their cotton brokering and banking. I didn't. I didn't. I mean, there, there are so many interesting stories. And when you start to realize, like, the extent of Jewish influence in America, it's an endless. So I did not get into the Lehman Brothers. I did not get into the Monsanto family. Um, certainly, these are families of interest that have, you know, that are still... Uh, have some kind of mark on today's world as well. So this is, you know, I couldn't possibly make this a comprehensive book of everything that has to do with the Southern, the Southern Jewish history. But again, there, there are so many other books available as well. This is a little, I guess, a portal into, you know, a, a few aspects of the history as I came across them. And you're, you're bringing up really good other ones that unfortunately I just, I didn't, I couldn't include everything. Yeah. Um, this is a question that I know you talk about. I don't know that there's an answer, but how did the Southern Jews reconcile celebrating Passover when they had slaves? Well, that's the million dollar question that started my whole journey to tell you the truth. I mean, that really is the question I asked myself when I first saw that cemetery in Richmond in 2006 my big question was how could the Jews have fought for the South when they celebrate their freedom from slavery every year at Passover? And in fact, um, before I wrote this book, I wrote an article um, for the New York Times called Passover in the Confederacy because I wanted to ex explore that issue. So that was the first thing that I did to get into this, this whole thing. I mean, it's, you know, it hurts your brain to think about it, but and that's why I decided I wanted to go to the Jewish South and not, not just focus on the Confederates and why they fought. But, but I mean, why they fought was because the South was home to them. They were free to live as they wished. They could uh, practice their religion, move up in society. Like I said, like life was good in the South if you happen to settle in the South. And they were willing to fight for that. So then my question was, well, what was like what was life like in the South? And that's why I decided I wanted to go see it for myself. So that's, that's the best question. And I think that's the thing that is the thread throughout the book. Uh, a few commenters are saying, talking about the symbols on the tombstones, that the hands on the tombstone indicate a Cohen doing the priestly blessing. And someone else says that the logs indicate that the person was cut down in the prime of life. Yeah, I did read that about the logs, but the funny thing about that particular cemetery was that everyone had a log, whether they were young or old, and that the family, um, 
they, they didn't just have those logs. There was actually a tree also. I didn't show you a picture of it, but there was a tree with the family name on it. And some of the family members who were buried were also engraved on the tree. And then the tree had its limbs cut off. So um, the family itself doesn't really know why that, why it was done that way, but they weren't all in the prime of their life. There were old folks buried there too, but who knows? Okay, we are coming up on just after an hour, so um, I'll ask one more question about your research. Did you use a certain library? No, I didn't use a certain library. I used all kinds of sources. I mean, I used a lot of secondary sources, like I said, other scholars who've written great things about Southern Jewish history, and then some archives. I spent some time at the College of Charleston, for example, and they have a Jewish heritage collection, some of which is online, which was fantastic. I was able to access some archives online from other universities. For example, I mentioned those letters from a Jewish family after the, the Nat Turner um, revolt. So there was not, not one place that I went. I, I did a lot of online research and accessed archives and letters and, and so forth in that way. But, you know, I also just went to small historical societies in the small towns. Um, for example, St. Francisville had a, a small uh, historical society that had information about the Jews that had lived there. So a whole variety of places. And of course I did interviews with people, so. And here's just a shout out um, for those interested. The Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience is expected to open in New Orleans next year. I'm looking forward to that. I can't wait. Great. So thank you so much. This was a really interesting conversation. I see there's a link to your website in the comments if everyone, anyone wants more information about you or to contact you or to see uh, some of your sources. So thanks again. This was great. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. And thanks again to the National Museum of American Jewish History. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thank you.